Hey, I'm interrupting this podcast to give you a brief ad, but this ad is about something that I actually use and love, and it's how I make this podcast. It's called Anchor, and Anchor is the easiest way to make a podcast. It's free, and there are creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer, just like I'm doing right now. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you, so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. You can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. I can't even say that word correctly, but there you go. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. Download the free Anchor app, or go to anchor.fm to get started. I'm using Anchor for this show, and I hope you enjoy it too. The ego can motivate you and propel you towards achieving great things, but the ego can also make you desire to be a celebrity Instagram influencer. So says David Summerfleck, a digital marketing executive expert who's here to talk about the intersection of mindfulness and the corporate rat race. David urges people to break free from life's hamster wheel, escape your comfort zone, and make decisions based on purpose, not fear. I'm Yugen Bond, your host. Follow me on social media at I Am Enoughism. According to the Times of India, Monday is actually the number one day for heart attacks in the U.S., Saturday is the least likely day. Talk to me a little about your experience bringing more mindfulness into the corporate landscape. Yeah, well, first of all, thank you for having me on your podcast. My area of expertise really is in marketing and specifically digital marketing because I, I originally I went to college with the intent of being a writer. I studied Shakespeare and Chaucer and Keats and medieval journalism, you know, and I ended up working for marketing and advertising agencies for well over 20 years. And, you know, in that capacity, I gradually went up the, the so-called ladder. You know, I started out in more menial positions and then gradually was, was given more responsibility in different positions. But I always was very aware how there was a profound disconnect between what people were doing and why they were doing it. And I'm not just talking about the people working in the cubicles with me, but also the clients we were working with. So yeah, Monday is the day that most people have heart attacks because, you know, you're starting the work week, you're coming off of jumping back into this stressful, you know, rat race type of environment after having two days off to relax. And I remember that, you know, my whole week was built around that weekend and the weekend was not a time to relax because when the weekend came, those were the only days that you really had to go and run errands. Those were the days where I had to go get groceries. I had to, you know, get my car worked on. You know, if if I um, needed to get my glasses repaired or something, well, you have to put that off until you till the weekend because Monday through Friday, you got to get up early so you can sit in traffic for an hour to get to work. Then you're at work. Half the time you spend in work you're not really doing what you're there to do. You're dealing with office politics, sexual harassment, and, you know, racism, discrimination, people not showing up, not doing what they're paid to do, whether they're supervisors who are incompetent or they're promoted because they're a family member or nepotism, whatever the case may be. So you're dealing with all that stress of being in the corporate type of agency and then you get off of work well most of the time when five o'clock comes you can't just poof you're in the car you know a lot and <laughs> most of the time you're yeah. you're still there hey look it's 5 30 I, I need to tie this up so i can get going i'm not getting paid for this or if you're on salary you basically do work 24 7 i mean obviously you can leave 
but you work more than eight hours as anyone who's on salary well knows. And then whenever you leave, it's going to take you an hour to get home in traffic. So, you know, you get off supposedly at five, by the time you get home, it could be seven, you know, how much sleep do you need? You know, and yeah, and, I, know, I'm exhausted want... just hearing that. Yeah. And I think that's the purpose is it's kind of this perpetual state of like low level to mid level exhaustion. And that's where the mindfulness element kicks in that sense of rebellion against the hamster wheel and realizing that you can separate yourself from it. It doesn't define you. It doesn't define you. It doesn't have to define you. And it shouldn't define you. And more and more people are discovering that, you know, they can work remotely and live anywhere. Now, granted, most jobs, most employers today in 2021 will not let you work remotely. You know, I remember 10 years ago, we had Skype 10 years ago. We had phones 10 years ago. We had email 10 years ago. What do you need me at the marketing agency for? Why do I have to be there in the cubicle? I mean, really, if anything, I, I remember many agencies I worked at, the people next to you would distract you because they don't know what to do. They need to ask your advice. I need this to finish up this white paper report that they're working on, or they have a problem with this SEO issue. So yeah. rather than have an area of expertise, now their drama becomes your drama that you're pulled into. I can't focus because I'm in the cubicle next to you. So in some ways, COVID has made employers realize, I know you like to be in control or feel like you're in control, but these employees can work from home and actually do what needs to be done you don't they, you don't have to physically see someone to know that they're working. I don't have to physically see my wife to know where she is. And, you know, but employ, employers love that. You know, what's interesting is Yahoo. Everybody knows Yahoo. It used to be a great company. It used to be a great search engine. And as soon as the new CEO came in, the first thing she did was say, no more people working remotely. I need to physically see you to know that you're working. And half the time, you'd have to be getting up and doing something so that you can be in their face. You know, when I work for marketing agencies, I'm in my cubicle in the corner doing my work. So the CEO of the company, to him, I don't exist because he never sees me. He shouldn't. To the, the project manager, doesn't need to see me. I'm in the corner doing my work. The reality is I could get more done faster if I'm at home, sitting in my home office, drinking some, some tea and, you know, get up when I need to get up, you know, whereas in the office environment, you can't always do that. So it's completely ridiculous, but people are still addicted to that. They're still addicted to that mindset of if I can't see it and touch it, it doesn't exist. If I can't see the employee and physically see them, you know, with their brow set, sweating in front of the, the PC monitor, then they're not working. And it's very dehumanizing. It's very exhausting for everyone involved. It wastes tremendous amounts of, of resources. It's very wasteful. Studies have shown that when people work remotely, they have less medical bills, they claim less sick leave, because they're at home, it's more safe, it's more secure, it's more calm for them. Their kids don't need to go to daycare because they can tell their child, come in here while I work in my home office. I actually talked to a person, a client was talking to me, a coaching client was saying, no, I can't work. I don't know what to do. I'm just not getting a lot done. I've got kids. I said, well, why don't you just have your, your, your child come into your home office, bring their crayons, bring their lesson plans, work in the home office with you. Just lay down on the floor, get up and go to the bathroom when they need to do it. Go yeah. get something to eat when they're hungry and come back and work with you. And if you're doing a call with Zoom or Skype or, or what have you, just say, daddy's getting ready to do a call on video. Shh, you got to be quiet. 
If you need to do something, get up and do it and just be very quiet while you see me on video, okay? If you have a, a child that you've taken care of and raised properly, that's not the biggest deal. We can't do this. So the workplace can grind you up and spit you out. And there's all of this adulation of the pressure cooker environment. You know, you can't be driven enough. You can't work hard enough. I was watching Shark Tank the other day just to see how they were coping with COVID. And you hear the same tough talk. I'm a sales monster. Come on. The reality of the situation, tough guy, is that if you're a sales monster, then someone is paying. You have no home life. Your girlfriend or your boyfriend isn't getting quality time with you. If you're putting in all those hours, to what end? What is the end game? Why are you doing this? What's the goal? Is it to make more money for the company the, the, that can fire you at will if your quota ever drops below a certain point? The, there's a profound disconnect between cause and effect. And I really couldn't get away from it myself until I could reach the point where I could say, knock on wood, you know, I don't have to go and chase after clients. I don't have to be locked in the cubicle working maniacally to produce generic work that the clients don't really want and don't need, but they don't know. You're saying no to say yes to yourself. And you're kind of flipping the switch in your brain and asking, why? Why am I doing this? Why are these my daily habits? It's like night and day. You know, there was a marketing agency that I worked for and their clients were small business owners who were local and they were a marketing agency, right? So the small business owner would call them or their, the agency's code calling and advertising would connect to the small businesses. And they were basically selling generic, super cheap website templates. Of course, the small business owner doesn't realize we don't need a website. We need more customers. We're assuming that your generic template website will attract more customers that we need. But the disconnect was the marketing agency is just cranking out these generic templates, charging them several thousand dollars, the business owner is coming away thinking, oh, great, I'm going to be number one in Google. I'm going to get a million phone calls now. Six months later, they realize it's not happening because you were put into this hopper, this anonymous machine. The agency didn't care anything about you. They had no reason to. They never did any uh, auditing. They never asked you, what is it that you really want? Why do you want that? Who are you trying to attract and why? Who is your ideal customer and why? How do you propose we compete with all the competitors you have in this area? Whether you're a lawyer or a doctor or an accountant or an optician or an art gallery or a school, how are you going to compete with all these competitors around you? They don't know. So unless you do what's called intake or discovery, you can't get at that. So all of this automation, all of this hurry up, we've got to crank out the money. When I was working as an independent consultant, now I could finally slow down and say, wait a minute, I could take you or leave you. I don't need to chase after people. Let's be more deliberate and more mindful about what we're doing and why we're doing it. Yeah. A, a website is useless. Yeah. If you're not ranking in Google for a specific term or locally, you're not going to compete. And I talk to people every day and they, they scratch their heads or they're angry and they say, why am I not number one in Google? Well, let's look at what you've done. You thought that this supposedly free do-it-yourself template was going to make you number one in Google and a million people are going to be calling you. That's not how life works. What makes you think that you're going to get something for nothing? So it's a profound disconnect. Stepping off that hamster wheel is not about 
matriculating more and more clients more quickly, more and more and more. It's about saying no, be more deliberate about who you talk to, why you talk to them. If they're not committed and they don't believe in what they're doing, they don't believe it's worth investing in, tell them, I wish you all the best. We're not a good fit. Have a nice day. And you have more time to do what really matters. You're reminding me of something, I think it was Elon Musk who said something along the lines of businesses need to get rid of their PowerPoints and their presentations and meetings for the sake of meetings. And so many people are stuck in the process for the sake of process, the red tape, because it's always been there. And Right, yeah. Yeah, and they're so stuck on the end game. You know, yeah, and you do it because you think you're supposed to. Yeah. You know, it's like I was talking to someone earlier today about RFPs. So, for anyone listening who doesn't know what an RFP is, it's called Request for Proposal. And they're extremely popular with nonprofit organizations and government agencies. To someone who may or may not respond to the RFP, they're a walking, talking nightmare. The reason that they're like that, the reason they're so horrible, and and we as service providers, marketers, the reason we dread RFPs is because basically it's a report that's saying to you, here's what we think the problem is. Here's how we think you should solve the problem. Here are the tools you should use to solve the problem. This is the process you should use to solve the problem. This is how long it should take you. And these, you know, these are the tools that you should use. This is how much it should cost to solve the problem. So they're basically self-diagnosing what their own problem is without being experts, by the way. So they're diagnosing their own problem and then they're prescribing to you how to solve it, how long it should take, what tools you should use and how much it should cost. And then they wonder why six months or six years later, they have to go back and repeat the process all over again. It's a very wasteful thing, but they do it because they don't know any other way. They've been doing it like that for so long. They can't conceive of another way. So my response to RFPs is always to say, look, if you would be open to just having a video call with me, I'd be happy to talk to you about your problems in great detail. Let's set aside one hour and we can talk about the problems you're experiencing, maybe a half hour, and decide if we're a good fit for each other to move forward. But flip the script. Imagine going to the doctor and saying, this is what hurts. This is where it hurts. This is why it hurts. This is what medicine you should prescribe, what procedure you should do, how long it should take and what you should charge. They would never tolerate that. They would laugh you out of the office. Mechanics, accountants, lawyers, plumbers, no other service provider would would let you submit an RFP for how they're going to solve the problem. As a collective society, why do you think we're so obsessed with doing things that doesn't necessarily move a company forward? It doesn't necessarily advance teams. It just wears people out. And it's kind of just a lot of smoke and mirrors for the sake of smoke and mirrors. I think it's the comfort of the familiar. It's knowing what to expect and knowing how to do something and not having to change. I think it's the comfort of the known. You know what to expect day in and day out. You could be in a situation where you're desperate for money, you're not stable or secure. And a lot of people are like that. We stay at jobs that are killing us. I remember working at one marketing agency where the director of marketing, I I kid you not, I mean, he was a brilliant guy. And I learned an awful yeah. lot from, wor- from working at that agency. But he would shout obscenities at people. He would shout uh, slurs at people. He would throw things against the wall. He would fire people just on a whim. And then it was very stressful to work there because you didn't want to talk to him. Yeah. Because if your yeah. work, if you, if he thought anything 
about your work was not perfect, he would, he could conceivably yell and curse at you, which, you know, qualifies as an abusive workplace. You could probably file a lawsuit, I guess, somehow. But, you know, and then on, on any given day, he could say also, that was good. Go take a three hour lunch break, take the company credit card, get whatever you want. You can get enough food for a week, take a three hour lunch break. And I've worked at marketing agencies where I've had women come up to me and say, can you help me? So-and-so is making, you know, has been making suggestive comments. They won't stop. I tried to tell them I'm married. I don't like it. Please stop. It makes me uncomfortable. Yeah. They don't stop. They, they won't stop. And I, I got to the point where I would just say, why are you coming to me? And they're like, well, you're the only guy who, you know, minds his own business and does his work and doesn't come to work drunk or pick fights with people. I'm like, oh, that's not really a compliment. I mean, you know what I mean? I don't <laughs> yeah. want to be, I don't want to be the only stable person here and I'm yeah. attracting all of this chaos. So you, you know, I love working remotely because I don't need to deal with all the sturm und drang that is entropy of the modern American workplace. To what extent do you think the pandemic is forcing people, for lack of a better word, to shake up the status quo of their lives? People who would go in yeah. and work every day, now they're working remote because they have to because of safety concerns. And well, you know, for for a lot like of the that. people, for a lot of the people who have to work remotely, they couldn't have done it before, or they, they you know, they have to get someone's approval to do it. You have so many teachers out there who could all be teaching remotely, but aren't permitted to. The technology is there. Yeah. Children, children around the world have been learning remotely for years and years and years now. And most schools in the US, they will not permit it. And I get the reason, the, the justification is children have to socialize. They have to socialize, but at what cost? We still don't know what, a, you know, what this will do to children. There are little children who are dying from COVID. There are children who are getting all kinds of bizarre illnesses. If you Google long hauler or COVID-19 with the children, whatever word you want to put in COVID-19 children, there's all kinds of cases going on or taking place where children are contracting this and they're not doing so well or they're passing away. And it yeah. didn't have to, you know, I feel for the parents. It's like, what do you do? Would well, they need to socialize? I have mixed feelings about it, but I think to answer your original question, I think there are many, many people who are able to work remotely because of this and are very happy and are enjoying being able to work from home. And then there are people who probably make up the majority, I'm speculating, who are not permitted to work remotely. And perhaps they could, but they're not permitted to do that. So they have to risk their, their own health and safety and that of their families and in going into work. Yeah. And when you are forced to flip the model around, I think what tends to happen is you say no in order to say yes to yourself. And then you start living a life that's more filled with compassion for yourself and compassion for others. Yeah. Yeah. When COVID first began, I remember seeing the videos of a woman in Wuhan. And, and some people listening may remember this. I saw a video of a woman just falling over, just all of a sudden, just being completely still and just falling forward. And that was it. And I remember looking at the video and telling my wife about it. And I said, you know, I don't think this is clickbait. I don't think this is some kind of bogus video. This looks like a legitimate news source. And I have a feeling that this is coming for us now. And we need to stock up on beans and rice because I have a feeling this is going to come here. We don't know how bad it's going to be. They're not going to do anything. That was what I said at the time. Yeah. And I remember I had an interview scheduled at a marketing agency. This was when it, this was first beginning. 
I didn't need to do it, thank God. But I, I still love the work. So I was going to, you know, go to the interview. And when this happened, I said, you know what? I think this is the universe telling me, David, stop wasting your time being an order taker when you don't need to be. Instead, be someone who can really make a difference. And maybe, you know what? Instead of working in an office and doing work that you enjoy, but feeling like it's being taken and twisted out of shape and watered down and homogenized and used yeah. like in, in an assembly line, you, now you can be more specific and more targeted and more deliberate and more picky. And just say, if you don't feel you need this and you don't value it, then it's not for you. If I have to convince you to care about your business and invest in order to grow, we're not a good fit. If you think some, you know, do it yourself generic template is going to help you grow a business, we're probably not a good fit for each other. Have at it. Yeah. Yeah. I I think it's because at least in the media, people tend to be so obsessed with that overnight success story that actually right. that actually took 10 years, you know. Yes. The Olympic athlete you know, winning the gold medal, crying, and, you know, you don't realize, you know, the time they may have broken their leg and you know, they yes. were almost out forever. And, but also the 20 yeah. or 30 years it took them yeah. to get there. You know, it's like, I talk to business owners every day. And it's like, if you look at Shark Tank, and they watch that show, they think, or they can think that they wake up in the middle of the night, they have an idea for a business, they become millionaires immediately overnight and everything is perfect and they're buying yachts and mansions and sports cars for all of their friends and all the celebrities love them. And of course, you can't get something of value for nothing. You can't grow a tree overnight. And people are addicted, I think, to what I call the Burger King mentality that they want everything their way immediately and it should be super cheap. You can't have it your way and you can't have it immediately if it of lasting value. That's the catch. There's yeah. nothing of value that comes for free or super cheap or immediately or overnight. And you hear these stories all the time about these magical guru guys. That's what I call them. How you can make a million dollars with no money down overnight. How this magical lotion will make you look 20 years younger. You know, how if you if you can only read this book, you can become a millionaire, how you can automate a business to run itself. And then you can go and sleep in your chaise lounge on the, the shore of some beach in Mexico and your business yeah. runs automatically. The thing is, what, what, what they don't tell you is it either took them 20 years with multiple failures to get to that point or they're just writing something that's totally fictitious. You know, if you look at everybody who is on Shark Tank, they all, pretty much all of them have books that they wrote. And they all tell you in those books how they struggled for years and years, and if not decades. Oh, you mean the judges on Shark Tank? Yeah. And, yeah. you know, and the people who make it will tell you later, they slept in their cars they lived in, in total poverty for years and years. You know, let me see, Damon John, you know, said that he, he lived with his mother. He he sold he sewed up the decals on t-shirts in his mother's kitchen for years and years. He sold the t-shirts at bus stops in the rain. You know, there's a lady at Barbara Corcoran, I think, said that she, she was a waitress for years and years and years. And so funny struck. to picture her now as a waitress. <laughs> right. but, yeah. but, and, she's, and she's not 21. She started yeah. her business later in life. You know, Kevin O'Leary, you know, he, he talks like a big shot. But his story is, look, he started one business decades ago in his parents' basement. What did he do? Well, his parents gave him an office space. 
that he could run in this basement. You know, how, how was he supported? I don't know. But he talked about, you know, years of his life, you know, wandering around partying, being a photographer, you know, and until his father came and talked to him and said, look, you need to get real. You're, you're wasting years of your life. You need to get a grip. He didn't become a, a a millionaire immediately in, in all of this. And I'm sure he'll tell you that, you know, he had businesses that went under or invested in businesses that were failures, you know? So, I mean, you, you know, it's like they say in the NFL, you know, put your head on swivel and wear a cup because it's dangerous out there. You know, it, it just doesn't, it doesn't happen immediately overnight. And people love that. They want it to be that way. We all like fairy tales, but that's not reality. Things change and you have to adjust with changing times or you're going to be one of the people left hung out to dry. And, and there are a lot of people right now who are hurting, who are suffering, who can't get food, who don't know where their next meal is coming from. There are many people out there who are shaken to their core because of what happened in, in our election, you know, on, on both whatever spectrum they believe it was a conspiracy against their hero or their they believe that who they voted for did win but now they're terrified of what could happen in the future you know so it's really important vitally important to have your head screwed on tightly and know that there is cause and effect that there are things larger than the ego i want well you may want it but do you need it because the, the yeah. less you can, the less you can be a consumer and the more you can pay down your debt, the more auton autonomy and the more real power you'll have in life. Because the less debt you have, the less you own, the more you have saved, the more you can pick up and leave, the more you can also decide, I don't want to work at this abusive job anymore. I don't want to work for this job that demeans me, that doesn't give me health care or live in this country for that matter, that, that will never have, you know, a national healthcare service. If you think about it, you know, every country but America has a national healthcare service that covers its citizens. So if they get sick, they're covered. The US is the only country that doesn't, that the quality of your healthcare is completely dependent upon how much money you make, what kind of a job you have, how good your benefits are. Yeah. You know, but if you're not a consumer or you cut back on it, you can save more. You can say, I'm, I'm checking out of this abusive system. I'm going to move somewhere where they do have a national health care program or the, the health care is affordable. If you go to Mexico and you need a root canal, I think I don't remember the exact prices, but it's like a quarter of what it would cost in the U.S. You know, it's just it's ridiculous. So the, the less you consume, the more you're deliberate about what you do and why you do it and what really matters to you and why. Ask yourself these tough questions. Why am I really doing this? Why am I throwing this rice at the wall and, think, and, 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 and hoping some of it will stick? Yeah. Why am I doing this? What are my goals and do these really matter to me? You know, yeah. why, you know do I want more customers? Or do I want more of the right type of customers? Is what I'm doing enabling me to achieve this? Or do I just not know? And I'm afraid to even say this because nobody seems to know WTF they're doing. Or I don't know where to begin and I feel intimidated. Ask yourself these tough questions and you get a lot more back in return. You do. And that's the entire concept of anephism is yeah do you I had have so enough are you enough yeah. yeah i had so many people who were calling me and emailing me on a daily basis asking the same questions every day and this is a part of having a deliberate process by the way i put together i wrote a book and then i put together an ebook that's like visual cuz first i wrote a book to, to address all these common questions that people have every day. Then I thought maybe I could make it even more fun for people and more like an experience. 
So make it illustrated with all these infographics and diagrams and, you know, cartoon characters and stuff. Try to make it fun Bring and it digestible. Yeah. You try, try to do it like that. And it, I don't know how I'm going to get it onto Amazon and, and Barnes and Noble and Books a Million yet because it's got so many infographics, it's very hard to format. But the idea is to give these complex concepts to people. So you try to get them to think about complex concepts in a really simple, direct way. Look, you want to get from point A to point B. What's at point B? What are you going to do when you get there? Right. Yeah. And if they don't think about these things, they won't know what, you know, I remember just as a brief aside, I remember actually several cases where I worked with companies and the worst thing in the world for them was to be number one at Google. They had no idea what to do. I had a nonprofit organization and I, I'm like, you know, look for a specific local city, there wasn't much competition for their terms. So I knew I could make them number one. As soon as the website went live, about two weeks later, I should say, the founder calls me up and she says, you got to take this website down. I said, why? What's wrong? She said, we're getting phone calls and emails every day. And I'm like, isn't that good? She's like, well, we're getting donations too. It's terrible. I said, well, what happened? She admitted after talking for a few minutes that they had misrepresented themselves. They were not established 501c3. They didn't have a legal bank account set up. They were terrified of what would happen if they were audited by the IRS. They yeah. didn't have the infrastructure set up to actually help the people who are calling. And then when people called to volunteer, they didn't have any infrastructure. They didn't know what to do with them. So their only answer was take the website down, just delete it completely. So they achieved me? exactly what they wanted and it wasn't what they wanted at all. Right. And how does that make me feel? And whose fault was it? Was it their fault for misrepresenting things, but not knowing how to scale? Or was it my fault as the expert for not fully screening them and then onboarding them and training them? First of all, are you a good fit for me? Are you real? How do I know you're telling me the truth? That Can I investigate? I don't know. Can I investigate them? Whatever. But then training them also. This is how we, we scale for accelerated growth. Are you with me? So could a process have vetted them? Maybe, probably. But it's also possible they could have slipped through it by misrepresenting things. But it was very demoralizing. And it made me feel terrible for them, but also terrible for all the work that was done. It could have been so much more. So now I, I screen people very thoroughly and then I onboard them. And that's where having these workbooks come into the process because the process now is so organized. But it also goes back to cause and effect. If you want something of value, put in deliberate organized effort over time and then you will see the tree grow you'll see yourself achieving more and more and more but you got to be deliberate you have to be mindful yes you need just like you said mindfulness and that's why the average american business does not last for more than 16 months which is i mean actually pretty sad if you think about it the United States Small Business Administration, Forbes Magazine, other sources all have said the same thing multiple times over and over again. I cite it on my own website. It's just a very common statistic. Most businesses statistically will never make it, never make it. They're going to be gone within three years. And by five years, the overwhelming majority will be gone. What's interesting is if you flip it and reverse it, after five years, if a business survives beyond that five-year period, they have a greater likelihood of achieving financial stability and generating profit, increasing revenue over and over again and expanding because yeah. they, learned, they learned the lessons the hard way. They made it through that difficult, rocky period, and now they're stabilized. They could go from small, struggling small business to more profitable enterprise business where they can have 50 or more employees in multiple locations. They've made it. But the attrition rate is so high 
because so many people are desperate. They want to believe in, in a hollow dream that some magical guru guy tells them in a commercial or they see on TV or something. And it's, it's unfortunate to say the least, you know, but that's why the, 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 the failure rate is so high. The way you break that cycle is by reading books about business, reading how to start a startup, you know, you know, thinking it through before just jumping in. I need to find an experienced professional, you know, mentor or provider who has, you know, references and case studies who, you know, I, I can really talk about these goals and we can sit, set uh, realistic, achievable goals who will work with me and we can hammer out a budget somehow or, you know, that's what they need. But when most people just jump into it, that's what's going to happen. Yeah, for sure. Well, I think your words and your stories will definitely help bring awareness to all of these issues. Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> I mean, really, it's about being connected to your higher purpose. You know, what you really want to attract for your life long term, rather than acting out of a place of fear. Yeah, acting out of a place of strength. And empowerment. Yeah. yeah. And by doing that, you come to terms with taming the ego, I think. Yes, I think so too. Taming the ego. That's great. Yeah. I mean, yeah. if I can just say very briefly, the ego isn't always your enemy. I mean, the ego can motivate you that you want to take care of your family. You want to be proud that, you know, your husband or your wife or your partner can look at you and go, because of you, we're able to pay the mortgage, we're able to pay the rent, we're able to send a, a child, you know, through college, you were able to, you know, have a, a good future. So the ego can be a good thing, it can motivate you and propel you, you know, toward achieving these objectives. But it can also be bad in that it can make you feel like I, I, I want to be an influencer, I want to be a celebrity on Instagram. For what? You know? Yeah. It's ego versus sit. envy. Right. So you have to harness it and use it by asking yourself the, the relevance of your long-term goals and how they fit into your life, your higher calling, your higher purpose, what you really want to attract for your life long-term, where you see yourself in the picture completed. There's a quote that I love very much from Henry David Thoreau that's just perfect for this. And he Thoreau is the author of Walden, which is a classic. And he has this quote, build your castles in the air for that is where they belong. Now put your foundation beneath it. And that's really the challenge for people to do. And I think if I think Walden is a business book, and I think most people just don't know it. And, and it's very, very relevant in today's society, especially now with so much going on. Thoreau was the original social distancer who <laughs> isolated himself. Um, yeah, he, he did it. From so he the could world. Like, yeah, he said it. he did it. He did it so he could live life more deliberately and to simplify his life and get to the core of who he was and why he was. If he hadn't gone to Walden Pond, he never would have written a book that became a classic. I mean, the same thing, George Orwell really didn't achieve much success until the latter part of his life and didn't write Animal Farm or 1984 until he went into isolation and just said, I've had it with this rat race and all this crazy you know, stuff going on. I learned everything I need to learn. I'm just going to go live somewhere where I can be you know, relatively isolated, he had, you know, a nice house with some, some property and just could focus on, you know, what brought him to the dance. And that was being a writer. So now he could focus in on writing what was his, his core, his diamond, you know, in his chest, in his heart, you know, and that was Animal Farm in 1984, all of the pain, all of the suffering that he had gone through in his life was in those two books. It was in others, but the bulk of it was in those two books. And it's, it's like that for so many, 
you know, great artists and writers who, you know, when they were separated from the rat race, they could really do what they were here to do. Yeah. And you know why? Because when you're in that flow state, that creative state where you just kind of let your ideas bounce around, like, like I went to this museum once and I was looking at Da Vinci's notebooks and they're so detailed and so meticulous and so beautiful. And you think about that in comparison with, you know, people who can't get through a 20 minute meeting without pings and emails and all Mm -hmm. these distractions. And, and it's such a different state of mind to be in. And I think that's what we all need to get ourselves back to. And we have a choice to do that, to put ourselves in that flow state, to kind of pull back from the noise of society and and live our lives with compassion. And like you said, the ego can be our friend, but you have to utilize it to your advantage. Right. Instead of being live more deliberately instead of being an actor on the stage wouldn't it be so much better if you could write the actual play and direct how it's going to be performed you can't do that unless you slow the f down and really look at what you're doing and why you're doing it and i had to learn that i had to learn that the hard way right as probably almost everyone in the entire world (laughs) Like Jim Morrison said, nobody gets out of here alive. We will close out the show on that. So, David Summerfleck, thank you so much for your words of wisdom. And thank you for listening to Enoughism. Congratulations. You've made it to the end of the Enoughism podcast. I'm your host, Eugen Bond. Before you go, follow me at I Am Enoughism on social media. And visit IamEnoughism.com to read my interviews and purchase the Enoughism ebook on Amazon. Thanks for listening. You are enough, just as you are. See you next time.